Good morning. We're certainly blessed with the music in this church. We're blessed to have you here this morning. We've already, as the service was starting, got a, a text from Pastor Scott. And Scott was sharing with me that he was praying for the service and that he's watching online, which tells me that he loves you so much. And even when he's homesick, he can't help but stop thinking about you and what's going on here uh, because he loves you guys so much. And what a great pastor we're blessed to have who loves the Lord and who loves his church. And so we certainly are praying for him this morning, that God will bless and heal him, and he'll be back in his usual routine before too many more days, we hope and pray. Let me take just a minute to put on my association director's hat and just remind you of two opportunities coming up in the near future. Uh, the first is happening on Tuesday mornings and Thursday nights. We're having a witnessing class called The Best News. It's only last three sessions. We started the first last week, so you're coming in on the second, but I don't think you'll, you'll be able to pick up because uh, this coming Tuesday or Thursday night, it's the same class either night. You can come either time, 9 Thursday, 9.30 Tuesday morning, 7 o'clock Thursday evening. And we're really getting into the plan of salvation called The Best News. And if you're available, you've got time, come join us for an hour, and it will help encourage you to learn how to share your faith a little easier, a little better. And there'll be one more class after that one. The other thing I wanted to remind you about with the, on the association opportunity is October 8th, Sunday evening. We're having our fall uh, annual meeting. Hope that you can join us. Dr. Ron Lynch will be our guest speaker for the evening worship service, which should start about 6.30. Uh, he's a well-known preacher and evangelist, so for that evening service, we want it to be very much like a revival service, and we're going to try to structure it that way. We'll do the majority of our business and reports from different institutions in North Carolina in the earlier session, which starts at 4 o'clock. Also having a free meal that's catered, and that will be at Deep Springs Baptist Church. Again, that's October 8th. Hope that you can join. Uh, join us for that. Anybody is welcome to come be a part of that. You don't have to be a messenger from the association. Now, when we have our little bit of business, only the messengers can vote. But we want everybody to come and worship and fellowship and enjoy uh, the information, the preaching, uh, and the great music that we'll be enjoying. So hope that you can join us on October 8th. All right, I'm taking my association hat off and putting on my new home hat back on now. In just a moment, we'll, we'll be looking at Joshua chapter 24. Joshua chapter 24. We'll be looking at a couple of verses there, but especially verses 14 through 15. Later, we'll be jumping to Kings 18, uh, but I'll let you know about that when we get a little closer to that. I'd like to share a story with you. As we get started, uh, sometimes we don't always make the best decisions, do we? Man went out to eat with his wife, and they went to their favorite restaurant. Uh, it was a busy night. They were full and hustling and bustling. There was a, a line waiting. And so he went to the hostess and gave his name, and he was several couples back and uh, had to wait a while. And he noticed another couple got tired and frustrated with the waiting, and they grumbled, you know, I'm tired of waiting, let's go, and, and they left. One long after that, hostess came by looking for the walkers. Walker family, walkers, walker family. Husband leaned over to his wife and said, hey, if we tell her we're the walkers, we'll get to go in now, won't have to wait. So they get up, and they go over to the hostess. She looks at them, walkers, the man nods. And so she said, good, your family's here waiting for you. <laughs> Sometimes we don't always make the best choices. And our choices can bless us or our choices can get us into trouble. And the truth is, we've all had that experience in life. There always have been times when we didn't make the right choice. And we knew when we made it that it's not the choice we should have made. Uh, in our text for today. Joshua challenges the people of Israel and you and I today to make a very important choice. Let me give you a little bit of background in Joshua chapter 24. Let me kind of put this in perspective as what the time period is and, and you know, what's going on in the text. Okay, So this is after God has done all those miracles about bringing the children of Israel out of Egypt with all the plagues and the parting of the Red Sea. They wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. God provided manna for them to eat. He brought water out of the rock. 
He brought them meat when they grumbled about meat. A uh, quail dropped all over the camp. So God was continually doing great things to bless and provide for them, even though they weren't always appreciative of what God did or when. And as it got time to go into the promised land to claim the land that God had promised them, God even dried up the Jordan River, made it stop at one point and pile up on the banks. It was that flood stage, by the way. So the people of Israel went over the Jordan on dry land. And then one of their first battles was walking around the Jor- uh, walking around Jericho. Thank you. I've had an extremely busy week, so if I'm a little duller than usual, give me a little grace, please. Uh, I don't promise to be the brightest crayon in the box anyway. So they walked around Jericho seven times. What happened? Balls fell down. Right? What a miracle! They did. You know, they took that city very easily because of the power of God. So my my point in saying all this, these people saw and experienced the power of God in extremely exceptional ways. If I think the children may have remembered coming out of Egypt, uh, and even if they didn't, those that didn't, who weren't old enough to remember that, heard the stories from their parents. So they they heard the stories, they saw it themselves, and now this is years later. They're in the promised land. They've conquered a good chunk of it. They're no longer fighting at this point. There's peace in the land. They're enjoying the fruit of what God is giving them. And Joshua now, very old in his age, is calling them together for one last national meeting. So he can address them one more time and challenge them. So that's the background of what we're going through. In Joshua chapter 24, verse 11, uh, he reminds them of how that God brought them into this land and all the peoples that they had displaced and that God had given them the victory over. At verse 12, um, he reminds them how, well, let me read verse 12 and 13 of Joshua chapter 24. There, Joshua. And God speaking through Joshua said, I sent the hornet ahead of you, which drove them out before you, all those other people and lands, right? Also the two Amorite kings, you did not do it with your own sword and bow. That's very important. God said, you didn't really do this. I did it for you. You you cooperated with me, but I'm the one who did this for you. God did it. Verse 13, so I gave you a land on which you did not toil, cities you did not build, and you live in them and eat from vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. So God is emphasizing to them through Joshua all that he's done for them to bring them to this point and to this day. How God blessed them, provided for them, gave them victory, gave them a land, gave them houses and and vineyards and crops and, and farms that They didn't earn. They didn't plant. They didn't set up. God gave them all of this to fulfill his promise that went all the way back to Abraham. Now in verse 14, it's a key verse, 14 and 15. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Let me just pause there for a moment. The fear doesn't mean be literally afraid. It's talking about that that holding God in awe and reverence and respect and worship. It implies obedience, which is the next thing, serve him. So he's challenging and reminding them, I've done all these things for you. Now, this is what I expect of you. I expect you to hold me in in awe and reverence and to obey and serve me with faithfulness. So he goes on to explain some of what that looks like. Throw away the gods your forefathers worshiped beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose lands you were living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We'll stop there. On this day, Joshua, the leader of the people for so many years, the successor of Moses, called on them to make a choice, either worship the one true God or worship a dumb idol. You can take that in more ways than one. But that was their choice. He was giving them a choice. God gives us a choice. We don't have to worship him if we don't want to. I'll come back to that. 
So they had two choices, God or idols. Idolatry had been a problem for the Jewish people for centuries, from the time of Jacob and Rachel. Despite God's mighty works, his grace in the lives of each generation, they still struggled with that attraction to idols, even up to the time of Joshua, even seeing all that God had done for them. So in verse 15, he mentions specifically the God of the Amorites. That was the land that they were living in there in Canaan. And uh, I can understand maybe some of the attraction from, for them, for that false God. Uh, they were, Baal and Astaroth were fertility gods and goddesses. And they were in a land trying to learn how to do farming and agriculture. They've been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, so they didn't probably remember a whole lot about that or know a lot about that. And so I can see where they might want some help on that issue. They wanted some help, you know, sending the rain when it was needed and helping the crops to grow and that kind of thing. And then there was always the lure and pagan worship of the celebrations and the parties and the drinking, and that often also went along with the pagan ritual sexual immorality. I can see how that would be attractive to some. Now, we live in 2023. What has that got to do with us? Is idolatry a problem in America today? I mean, not only do we not live in the Middle East, you know, we're living in 2023. Does that have anything to do with us today? Does anybody in this country bow down and worship a, a stone idol or whatever wood, whatever it might be made of? It doesn't matter what it's made of. Does anybody in America worship idols today? Yeah, they do. Literally. I'm talking literally first. We'll talk figuratively in a minute, but literally they do. There are thousands of Hindus, thousands of Buddhists, hundreds of Wiccans that live right here in North Carolina. You don't even have to go to a far off place in America. They're right here in North Carolina and they worship idols, literally. So that is a problem even for us here. And then there is, of course, the figurative idols, those things that we let become more important to us than God. Um, they're different things for different people. We all have the, the one that's the most tempting for us. One of the big false gods of America today is ourself. We put ourselves first. You deserve the best, the advertisers tell us. We look out for number one. You know, those are some of the old sayings that go along with that it's all about you. Some people worship themselves. You can tell it when you've been around them for a little while because their life is focused on them. They don't really care that much for you other than what you might can do for them. They're not very nice people to be around. God of some folks is pleasure. They just, they want pleasure. And, and there are different kinds of that even. You know, for some, it might be the pleasure of sexuality. For some, it might be alcohol or drugs. They're just looking for pleasure. And that's what's most important in their life. For some, it might be money or materialism, power. For others, it might be fame. You know, we always want to be famous. We want to somehow be better than everybody else. We don't usually talk about it in that terms, but that's really what it means. When we want fame, we want everybody to look at us and notice us. What we're really saying is we want to be better than everybody else. For some, it, for some young people, it can be computer games. You know, the young people are all wrapped up in computer games. They live, eat, drink it. It can become more important than God to them. Remember, anything that becomes more important to us than God is like an idol to us. Gambling. It can even be science. If we let science be the end-all, tell-all of, of our existence and what we believe and how we live, then that can become like a God to us. The problem is with that God is they got to rewrite the book every couple of years because they can't keep their mind made up as to what's true and what's not. Sometimes what we call science isn't so scientific after all, not very reliable. Sometimes our friends can become our God. Whether you're a teenager or an adult, there is still that temptation. We worry about what our friends think of us, what they say about us. Will they reject us if we talk about Christ or if they know that we're trying to live the Christian life or if we don't do what they do? Whether we're a teenager or adult, we worry about that. Or maybe it's the boss at work, you know. 
He wants us to do this and to compromise this way, to lie to this customer, to, to drink at the party so we'll fit in and, or drink with a customer so you know, we can, can wine and dine, whatever. We get that subtle pressure to be different, not to live the Christian life. And if we let that become more important than what God says, it can be like an idol to us. You can tell a lot about a person looking at their close friends that they hang out with, can't you? Your friends can pull you up or they can pull you down. They can make you better. In fact, there's a verse in the Bible that says, iron sharpens iron, so one friend sharpens another, something like that. And if we choose the right friends who will increase our faith, strengthen us, encourage our commitment to Christ, they can help us to grow and develop and be better Christians. If we spend to invest our time with people who don't love Jesus like we do, who are not fully committed to Jesus, they can weaken our faith, weaken our commitment, and draw us further away from God. Let's, like, let's be choosy about who we choose as our best friends. Now, we need to be friendly with everybody. Yeah. As Christians, we love and we want to be a friend, a friend to everybody, but our best friends, the one we're going to invest our time with the most, that have the most influence on us, we need them to be good, godly Christian folks, if that's who we want to be too. All right, we talked about Israel and their temptation for idols. And then we talked about all that God had done for them. All that God had done for them. He'd done miraculous things for them. I mean, nothing that I've experienced is like what the people of Israel experienced coming out of Egypt and claiming the promised land that God promised them. Awesome things God did. And yet they're still tempted to idol worship. It doesn't really make sense to me in a lot of ways. But we're kind of in that boat too. God's been good to us too. Now, he's not been as extraordinarily obvious about it. Uh, he hasn't parted the Red Sea for us. But what has God done for you? What has God done for you? Didn't he send his son Jesus to die on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins that you deserve, that you did in his own holy, perfect body? Didn't God raise him from the dead so that he could be your savior, wash away your sins, give you a new life now and eternity in heaven? Isn't God good? I'm glad there's nobody here naked, which says that God's given us clothes to wear. God's given us someplace to live. God's given us food to eat. God's given us family to love, friends to love. God has blessed us in so many ways. All that we have that is good is God's blessing and goodness to us. So just like ancient Israel, God has been good to us too. But we don't always recognize it or give him the credit for it like we ought to. But when we stop and think about how good God is and how much he loves us, how can we be tempted to let these other things become more important in our lives than God is? Deuteronomy 32, 39 says, So now, see now that I myself and he talking about the one true God. And God goes on to say in, in Deuteronomy 32, there is no God beside me. I put to death, I bring to life, I have wounded and I will heal, and no one can deliver out of my hand. What in the world is God talking about? He's saying, I'm God, I've got all power. I can do whatever I decide I need to do. I can save a person, I can take a person out of here. God is all power. Think about the God that created the world that set the stars on fire. That God is all-powerful. There's only one true God, the one that made the world, the one who sent his son to die for us, the one who raised him from the dead. That's the true God. That's the God of power. None of these other things we're tempted to worship can really deliver us or help us or do that much for us. Nothing compared to what God has already done and will continue to do for us if we trust him and put him first in our lives. There's only one true God. The beginning of the Ten Commandments is about keeping God first, right? In verse 3 of Exodus 20, You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything. And then God says in verse 5 there, You shall not bow down to them or worship them. 
We need to put God first. We need to trust Him. So don't let anyone or anything have the place in your life that God should have. Yes, we need to have friends. Yes, it's good to have ambition, you know, but God comes first. Put Him first. Trust Him. Trust Him, because sometimes we are going to be pressured. We are going to be pushed to see if we really believe what we say we believe. And we'll be, people are going to want us to compromise and turn our back on God. Don't do it. Don't do it. Put Him first. Trust Him. Yes, you may have to pay a price for that. I'm not going to deny that it will be easy, nor am I going to deny that you won't suffer for standing up for Christ. If I am going to promise you that God will be with you, God will be with you. He'll bring you through it, and He'll bless you for being faithful. He'll bless you for being faithful. After reminding Israel of all that God had done, Joshua challenged them in Joshua 24, 15, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Joshua said, choose now. Choose this day. Don't keep playing the game. Don't keep switching back and forth. Don't try to have your cake and eat it too. Choose this day. The day is the day to make up your mind. The day is the day to get it right. The day is the day to be real. Another awesome story in the Bible uh, where God calls his people to make a decision to stop switching back and forth between both sides, but to fully devote themselves to him. It's back in 1 Kings chapter 18. During the time of Ahab and Jezebel, the wicked king of Israel, who had been murdering the prophets, who had done all they could to stamp out worship of God and encourage the people to worship Baal and Ostaroth and those Canaanite deities, and had been pretty successful at it until God had enough. Uh, remember, the Canaanite gods were supposed to help them with rain and fertility, growing the crops and that kind of thing. So God decided that he'd had enough and he was going to show them who the one true God was. He started with having a drought of saying there will be no rain for three years. I've seen in my lifetime some hard droughts. I've never seen anything to compare with a drought for one year, more or less three years. Can't imagine how bad that must have been. God when God gets serious, he gets serious. He can get your attention if he wants to. He did that first with the drought. Then he went to Elijah and said, Elijah, uh, it's almost time to start sending the rain. I want you to go invite Ahab, tell him we're going to meet on Mount Moriah, and we're going to have a showdown. And God's going to show you who the one true God is. So Elijah finds Ahab, tells him what God has said. They agree to meet on Mount Carmel. And uh, Ahab comes with his 450 prophets of Baal. And the showdown is simply this. Each one is going to offer a sacrifice, but they can't light a fire under the wood to consume the sacrifice like they normally would. Whoever the real God is, that God has to send fire from heaven to burn up the sacrifice. That's the contest. That's the challenge. And so 450 prophets of Baal get together they prepare their altar and their sacrifice and, and they're dancing around their little offering there waiting for their God to send fire and nothing happens. It goes on and it goes on and it goes on. About 12 o'clock around noon, Elijah decides to have a little fun with them. Hey, maybe you need to shout a little louder. You know, your God might be hard of hearing. Hey, shout a little louder. Maybe, maybe he's thinking about something else, or maybe he's taking a nap, or maybe he's gone on a trip. Shout a little louder. Man, that really worked them up then, and they began to work themselves into a, a fever almost and began to cut themselves with swords and spears, and, and it was just wild and crazy from what the description I read in chapter 18 here in 1 Kings. And it goes on, and it goes on, and it goes on. And no one answers. No one answers. This uh, 1 Kings 18, 29 says, but there was no response, no one answered, no one paid attention. Now, Elijah's over here by himself. He's the only prophet there. 450 on one side with the king's authority behind them. And Elijah and God on the other side. 
Ahab didn't stand a chance. Not with God against him. So Elijah calmly puts an altar together, arranges the stones, puts wood on it, puts the sacrificial animal on it, who's already been slaughtered, and he does something else extremely unusual. He pours water on it. He has it covered with water. He had even dug a little trench around it, and the water wet the wood, wet the animal. The water covered the ground. It filled up the little trench he dug around it to make it that much harder to start on fire, I assume, is the point. And here it is. They've had a, a drought for three years, and he's pouring water out. I'm sure they must have had a lot of talking and mumbling about that going on. And Elijah just simply goes out. He doesn't do a song, a dance, a show. He just prays. He just prays. In chapter 18, 1 Kings, verse 36, at the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Pause there for a second. So don't leave here today and go try to call down fire out of heaven unless God tells you to. God told Elijah to do it, and that's why it worked. If he didn't tell you to do it, it ain't going to work. Okay. Verse 37, answer me, O Lord, answer me, so that these people will know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they prostrated, they fell on their faces on the ground and cried, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. Wow, what an awesome demonstration of the power of God. Wow, that God sent fire from heaven. Elijah simply prayed because it wasn't really about Elijah anyway, right? It's about God. So Elijah prays and God sends fire. It burns up the animal, it burns up the wood, it burns up the stones, it vaporizes the water that was still in the trench. When God does something, he does it right. <laughs> he got their attention and it scared them to death. So they're on their faces on the ground saying, Lord, you really are God. You really are God. Elijah had been challenging the people that day in verse 21. If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. God showed them who was the real God. He is. He is. And if God is really God, then follow him. If you want to follow something else, that is your choice. But if you choose that choice and you miss out on God's blessings, his provision, you miss out on his grace and his mercy, you miss out on so much of his love. He still loves you, but you won't be able to receive his love the way he'd like to pour it out on you. And worst of all, you'll miss a new life now in heaven forever and ever but it's still your choice. And the reason is your choice is because God loves you. See, love sets people free. You can't make somebody love you. That's not love. That is something else altogether. God could have wired us so that we automatically loved him, but that wouldn't be true devotion. That wouldn't be real love. That'd be like a robot. And that's not what God wanted. God loves us and he wants us to choose to love him back because he's a God of relationship. And our salvation is through our relationship to him. Go back to Joshua now and bring it back to him. Joshua put it this way, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord, he said. As a young Christian, hadn't been a Christian very long, uh, my family had not been to church much in many, many years when I became a Christian. So it was all somewhat new to me. I knew the basics of salvation. I knew Jesus died, that he rose from the dead. And I knew that you needed to invite him into your heart. I had, had done all that as your, as your Savior and Lord. But I didn't fully understand what that Lord stuff meant. And as I was involved in church in a youth group and, and attending worship services, they also had a Sunday night youth program, and then we'd stay for the worship service. And one particular night, not long after I'd made that decision for Christ, Pastor Elliot preached a sermon about making Jesus the Lord, the boss of your life, and giving him full control, complete control of your life. 
I don't remember a whole lot about that sermon. I remember the illustration that I don't have time to share now. But I remember walking home that night. It was less than a mile, wasn't that far? And thinking about what I'd been hearing, what I'd been learning in church. And I believe that God was God. You know, and if he's God, then he's the boss and Lord of everything. But I was finally beginning to understand what that meant for me. I mean, I knew it in my head, but I didn't know how that should affect my life. If I really believe that God's God and that he's the boss of everything, then he should be my boss. He should be my Lord. And I finally got it that night that being a Christian isn't just believing the facts about Jesus, but it's trusting him enough that you commit your life to live for him. That night, walking home, I told God that I know you're the boss, and I want you to be the boss of my life too. That decision I made as a 13-year-old, I'm still trying to live out today. I don't do it perfectly, but I made the commitment to do the best that I could with God's help, and I'm still doing the best I can with God's help. I'm still growing. I'm still learning. And I'm still walking with Jesus. I still want him to be glorified in everything that I do. I don't always succeed at that, but I'm working hard at it with his help. It changed my life. I wouldn't be where I am today if I hadn't made that commitment to God. Now, I don't want you to think that if you make that commitment and give Jesus 100% control of your life, that you end up being a preacher or that you end up having to go to China, some faraway place. It doesn't necessarily mean that. For a few, it does, but for most, it doesn't. For most of us, it means serving God where we are, being a a godly Christian father, being a a godly Christian in your workplace, not beating people over the head, but, but loving them with the love of Jesus. And when you get an opportunity to point them to Christ, invite them to church where they can hear the gospel and those kinds of things. I made a choice that night. This message is all about challenging you to make a choice. Have you made that choice? Or are you trying to be like too many Christians today? They say they're Christians, but you look at their life, you don't see much of the Christ in their life. Uh, They say they believe, but not living for Jesus. They're not going to church. They're not reading the Bibles. Even worse, they're not living for Him. They're not loving other people. They're not serving others or God. They're serving themselves. Their lives are all about themselves. You can't have it both ways. That's what we were reading in our text today. And that's part of what God is trying to tell us, whether it's through Joshua or through Elijah, that we need to stop trying to play both sides of the fence. Stop straddling the fence. Make a choice. Because until you make that choice and commit yourself, you're not going to fully receive the blessings that God wants to pour out in your life. You're not going to be fully content or happy until you put him first. If you keep making decisions in your own wisdom and in your own desires, you're going to reap the fruit of those decisions, which many times are not good. And we wonder how come we're so unhappy. It's because we're doing it our way instead of God's way. But when you do it God's way, it may not be the easiest way, but it's always the best way. And it will be the way that will make the biggest difference in your life that will bless you in the long run. Do you really trust God enough to give him control of today, to letting him be the boss of today and tomorrow and the next day? That's what faith is. We're saying we trust you. If we can trust Jesus to take us to heaven, can't we trust the all-knowing God who loves us? who sent his son to die for us, who raised him from the dead, who gave us life because he wanted somebody just like you to love. Can't we trust him for today too? Can't we trust him and choose to follow his will in our life? He won't make you. He won't force it on you. But he challenges you to choose it, to trust him. Will you do that today? Let's pray together. Father God, You are a great and awesome God, not only in your power, but in your love and your mercy. Father, it's because you love us that you want us to yield control of our lives to you. Thank you for being a God that gives us that choice. Lord, I pray that many here this morning, if they have not yet, will make that choice to put you first in their lives. Father, I pray that you'll help them to see the depth of your love, that you are a trustworthy God, and that while life is not always easiest, when you're the boss, it's always best. Lord, help us to trust you and to obey you and to love you the way that you love us. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
meditation to this morning is first to trust Jesus enough to receive him as your Savior. If you've never done that, then you're missing out on the best part of all. And I also want you to understand that if you have made that decision, that while it took me a little while to put it all together, that I realized Jesus needed to be boss of my life. He needs to be boss of your life too. Today's the day. Just like Joshua challenged Israel to choose this day, I'm challenging you this morning, choose this day. Are you going to serve God or not? If you're going to serve God, I challenge you, Christian, to come rededicate your life to living fully and completely for Him with the best of your ability and with His help. We can't do it in ourselves and our strength, but we can do a lot with the power and the help of His Spirit living in us. Will you come rededicate your life this morning to putting Jesus first? If you don't know Him, come accept Him today. Let's pray together and invite the God who loves you so much to be your Savior. Just want to come pray at the altar. The altar is always open.